yes, Anneli, you're saying? Okay. So welcome everyone to the second uh, seminars in the series we uh, are uh, organizing since two months back on Latin American and Caribbean historical ecology. Uh, a couple of months ago, we had the inaugural seminar um, by Bill Ballet discussing his Amazonian work. And you might find, you can find that the recording, if you missed that seminar, you can find the recording of it uh, on the iHopeNet.org um, latches page, and you will find that address also in the chat. And so um, th these seminar series are intended to uh, to provide a, a sort of being a being a venue for discussing historical ecological issues with that geographical focus on Latin America and the Caribbean, which is obviously an enormously big area, not least considering all the historical ecological research that has been going on there for, for a quarter of a century or so. Uh, anyway, so the it's we, the we think this will be good opportunity also to uh, particularly to think about how historical ecological research and historical research archaeological research can um, be in one way or the other applied or used or inform planning issues or, or the, the challenges of today. So that's one of the, one of the aims we have with this seminar series to try to, to bring those particular um, points of, of the insights that, that our historical research brings to the table uh, to address the current, um, different, different current challenges we have, loads of them, obviously. So today uh, we are shifting as uh, slightly going up north in, in relation to uh, the first seminar with, with Bill uh, to the uh, uh, Southern Mesoamerican region. And it's a great pleasure to, to, uh, to welcome Elizabeth Graham, Professor of Mesoamerican Archaeology at University Col uh, College London, where you've been at for the last 25 years or so, maybe more, slightly slightly more around that no no around that yeah 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 and um, before that you have been uh held in canada you yeah at york university and as well as being belize. the archaeological commissioner of belize uh yeah no less uh so uh without much further ado liz please i i welcome you to uh present on your research uh on soils okay when i share the screen will it be like like bill so my little face will show up as well uh, yes it will so you can take care of that or do i have to do something no, it will i think it will do that automatically oh okay uh well thank you for inviting me and uh greetings to everyone <clears throat> and i think that you will see that although i work in um uh, in mesoamerica the the projects and the research i'm talking about the applications are really outside that area. Well, they can be in that area, but um, their applications are broader. Okay, so I have I have a presentation. It is I don't think it's going to take a huge amount of time because I, I, there's so much to think about with this project that I thought I would prefer to present part present it and then leave it open for questions. Uh, and I think you'll you'll see why because and uh, there's so many sort of ins and outs and things that we still have to work on. But <clears throat> I've I've taught talk well I've titled it the waste of time. I have a paper out on that. And then that's another thing, uh, Christian. I haven't listed papers in this, but I can put a list of papers together and send it to you. Or if people are interested, they can ask me about anything that's been published on this subject. So um, my interest is uh, soil, what's called today soil security. Um, and what happens to what humans leave behind. So to that extent, I'm using the past, or I hope me and my team to use the past as a model, but the applications are meant to be uh, for uh, contemporary society. Um, and here I have pictures of one of our, our test pits at one of the sites on Ambergris Key that I've been working that shows what happens to what humans leave behind after a few after a few hundred years. Liz, and so, Liz, yeah, 
Uh, the we don't see your. Uh, did you? Um, are you? You well, maybe I didn't any, press their no, screen. We no, we don't see the PowerPoint. Okay. Mm -hmm. Should show up now, does it? Uh, it soon will, I think. Uh, well, we have your your desktop uh, background as well as the PowerPoint. N it now. should have yes. changed now, right? Yes, it did. Okay, sorry about that, everyone. It's been a while. Um, okay, so basics, you know who I am. It's, I'm at the Institute of Archaeology. Unlike most people, I don't have those little labels at the bottom of my slides that say the brand of my university. Um, so uh, I'm filling that information in. I work in Belize in uh, Central America, and I've worked there since uh, 1973 in various capacities. Uh, I've been interested in this topic really since I started my PhD research in 1975, uh, when I witnessed uh, these amazing uh, broadleaf forests that were growing in the middle of coastal mangrove swamps and got interested in how you know that sort of development would have taken place. However, I've never been able to interest funders in this project except for once. <laughs> However, I've had no trouble in my life or at least less trouble getting funding for more traditional research, which, which is interesting. So a lot of my research career has been spent on Maya history, Maya collapse, Spanish colonial period, British colonial period as well to a lesser extent, different periods in Maya history and uh, maritime trade and commerce. I suppose it has paid off, however, because I have a detailed knowledge of chronology in the sites where I've worked. And this is critical as the people who have worked in the Amazon uh, know. It's critical in establishing um, soil production rates or soil formation rates. Uh, so, so to that extent, extent the investment in, in chronology has been good. Uh, the project that I'm working on now, we're applying for funds and I call it Past and Future Earth. So in the following slides, when you see PFE, that, that's what, what it means. It's sort of the umbrella for where our thinking is at the moment. Um, now, the problems that I have always been interested in addressing with a uh, focus on soils, one is soil fertility. Uh, partly because these initial sites that I observed supported broadleaf forests and people came and grew crops in these areas. So there was some association of fertile soils where humans had lived and left a lot of rubbish and whatever humans do, behaving both well and badly, I guess you could say. Uh, so I was interested in this association or I am interested. And um, the other reasons have to do with soils in the modern world, because evidence suggests that present day use of soils is not sustainable. Oddly, climate change doesn't bother me that much because even if the climate stabilized, our soils are in trouble. So to me, the soil situation is more important, but I know I'm in the minority. Uh, we know that average global crop yields are progressively decreasing. And there's some very interesting papers on this. I'll, I'll include one, one in Nature that came out a few years ago that's especially, especially interesting. Uh, and it's true that insufficient nutrients are an agronomic problem in many areas. And there is also uh, the ability of many cereal crops to, to deliver their full yields has fallen in recent years. So, um, Soil fertility is an important issue that needs to be addressed. Okay. Uh, the other aspect that I'm interested in, uh, I've been well, I've been calling soil thickness or available soils. Now, this idea didn't come to me. Uh, it, it, one of my colleagues, who I'll introduce some of his work, Dan Evans, who is a soil scientist at Cranfield University. Uh, he, in our discussions, he came, came up with what is so obvious, it's like emperor's new clothes to an archeologist. And I can't, can't believe how stupid I was, but what he emphasized was that where uh, you find where people have lived 
usually we call them archaeological sites, but the, the available soil is always much thicker than would occur on uh, baseline or natural sites. And this is really important. I've been an archaeologist for over 40 years. I dig, dig, dig. And what do I do with the dirt? I throw it in a wheelbarrow and I take it away somewhere. And now I'm thinking, ah, dirt, this earth that accumulates on archaeological sites is something we should be looking at, the thickness of soils. Uh, there are rapid rates of soil degradation globally. Uh, Dan Evans is my colleague uh, I've told you about. He has a recent PhD from Lancaster University. And uh, from some of the work that he's doing now, uh, he's found that over 90% of conventionally managed soils are thinning. 16% have lifespans of less than, than 100 years. And uh, what this all tells us, looking at global soil fertility, looking at soil degradation, problems in soil management, is that there are shortcomings that persist in approaches to soil management as, as they exist today. And so this is what I would like, I had hoped my work uh, would, would address. So as I, I said, we as archaeologists are acutely aware that everything around us will eventually decay and disintegrate. We know that because we dig through what people thought would last forever. I dig through urban. I mean, one of the sites that I'm working on that I will talk a little bit about dates from about 1600 BC. It was urbanized by at least 600 BC. Massive amounts of monumental structures, residential structures, uh, year for hundreds of years and that decays if that decays your office is going to decay the chair you're sitting on is going to decay the walls around you are going to decay but for some reason we are we're blind to it most people are blind to it um, and that is one of the main thrusts of my work is that recycling which is one of the it's a good policy but it simply puts off the inevitable waste. And our priority should be on how, what we build, how we build it, what we throw away, and it's, it, what happens to it. It's chemistry, it's mineralogy, that avenue. So what we've been seeing when we look at older settlements, older cities, like the ones I'm looking at in the Maya area, but also I've looked at some, uh, some phenomena in Durham up north around coal mines that um, the products of decomposition contribute to the earth around us. So I feel that we are archaeologists. We are aware of this. We have knowledge that many other people don't have because we dig through hundreds of years of decomposition of the material world. How can we contribute to long term environmental planning and through soils, of course, to uh, food security, which is ultimately what, what I'm interested in. So why do I think the ideas behind PFE, which is what I'm calling our work now, what do we have to contribute? Well, I have worked at a number of coastal sites over the years, as well as the urban center of Lamanai. Uh, and they provide not only a detailed chronology, but settings where dense populations have lived for long periods, e even on the key. Uh, I've been calling that kind of a peri-urban environment because the economy on the key has always been uh, centered around what was going on in the mainland centers. Uh, so we find uh, dense, dense populations, variety of, of activities. So it's related to the urban center, but the, of course the towns and the villages were smaller. Uh, and the other factor about what I think we can contribute, I've already referred to, which is that there is a lack of consideration of long-term diachronic factors in modern studies of agricultural viability of soils and land use. I mean, I find it astounding, really. And it, here, here in London, when the uh, policy groups discuss you know, sustainability, I have to laugh, it's maybe two generations. And we archeologists have insights that we can, con you know, can contribute that, to me, 
can really wrestle with this concept of, of sustainability of what lasts a long time. Um, and then I've already touched on this, that uh, in studies of urbanism and sustainability today, including the circular economy, uh, the management of waste, products of decay, get far less attention than architectural design, energy use, and when waste and rubbish are the focus of attention, the solutions are emphasized recycling or uh, sometimes burial and sealed deposits as you find with nuclear waste. And yet archeology span tells us there is no such thing as a sealed deposit, no such thing. <laughs> And something can be recycled, that's fine, but eventually it will be thrown away. So what happens to it when it's thrown away? What, what should we be aiming for in terms of how products are manufactured? I think we should be looking at their decomposition, that when products are manufactured, uh, there have to be laws that take into account the chemistry, the physical components of these products, and anticipate how they will decompose. So what are the hypotheses of, of our project? Well, one is that there is a long-term positive impact on soil formation associated with dense populations and the range of activities that characterize urbanism. Um, I was just listening to Bill's talk and uh, yes, when he was discussing deforestation and degradation, it is true that modern populations do horrible, degrading things to the environment, and I'm not denying that. But what I'm saying is the behavior of modern city dwellers can also be turned towards long-term positive impact on soil formation, but this isn't examined at all. Uh, that the decomposition of the remains of activities associated with uh, dense human population should be subject to methodological inquiry with the purpose of serving as a model of best practice. And this is one of the goals of, of my next project. And I'll, I'm gonna show you a few slides from the Leverhulme project, which we did get funding for and how, um, how complicated it, it is to try to track decomposition of products through time and their effects on modern surface and subsurface deposits. Uh, usually in soil science, the idea that these very uh, deep uh, past deposits can have major effects on surface and subsurface soils is not a primary goal, but that was, that was the one thing I had hoped to show in my earlier project. It's going to take some work, but it's critical I think, and one of the things I'd like to do is to outline a methodology. I think we call it a methodology because it requires several methods of being able to track uh, things, what make them up, how they decompose, and how those decompositional products become part of uh, natural soil formation processes. Uh, and the third thing is related, and Christian will probably understand more of this because we've been working on various projects together with um, also Ben Vies and others over the last few years, that our modern day engagement with soils or lack of engagement attitudes towards waste will benefit from knowledge of neotropical agro-urban patterns of soil, con with soil connectivity. And this word I got from the literature, but it's one of the things that Ben and Christian and Dan and I have been interested in and Nick Dunning as well. Uh, soil connectivity and the society that I study, the Maya, developed in the absence of old world human grazing animal complex. This I think is critical because, and well, Bill will know this too, because we've talked about this years ago. There were no cattle or sheep or goats in the new world, but in the old world, domestication and agriculture proceeded in such a way that forests had to give way to pasture to feed grazing animals. This didn't exist in, in the neotropics and yet they developed urban concentrations of people. So uh, that a subsistence base that is minimally based uh, on animal 
uh, products, I think, is very important in the modern world. OK, so the hypotheses that we've been working on, one is um, what human activities change the character of the occupied land surfaces in past urban and peri-urban settings. And essentially, this is what archaeology does. It looks at what, what the human activities were through time. Uh, the second, what role do the changes wrought by human activity play in long-term soil formation? And that relates to what I spoke about on the previous slide about developing a methodology for decompositional uh, trajectories. And then the final one, which in a way might be the hardest, but perhaps the most interesting, can we link human behavior that has a range of purposes unconnected to improving soil, such as construction, uh, something with human household or industrial waste, burying the dead, throwing things out, losing things, essentially what people do. Uh, can we connect that behavior to land uses or activities that nonetheless maintain or increase soil health and productivity? So in a sense, I don't care what humans intended. I, I don't care if their behavior was good or bad. <laughs> what, what I care about is what they did and what they left behind. And whether they intended to or not is not my uh, concern at this time, because I think that people behaviorally, or as we look at any other animal, have things that they do that affect the world around them. And that is what I'm interested in. Uh, and this will be largely inadvertent behavior rather than intentional behavior. Uh, OK, so then I thought I'd just give you a little insight into how I got interested in all this. Some of you know this already. Uh, but these are just some of the, si the sites in Belize that I've excavated over, over the years. So you can see a lot are clustered along the coast. Um, most of the project work we've been doing is at Marco Gonzalez and San Pedro on Ambergris Key, as you can see there. But also, we're, I have worked at Lamanai, more traditional archaeology, but we are going to look, start to look, and one of my students, uh, graduate students, Francesca Glanville Wallace, will begin to look at decomposition, land use and decompositional trajectories at Lamanai. I had to throw this in because this is what kicked it all off in 1975 when I excavated coastal sites in the Stan Creek district of Belize. And on the left, you see uh, one of the sites in the middle of mangrove swamp. And on the right, you can see one of the Saiba pentandra trees. I was, I was just blown over by uh, the diversity of plants and animals that one would find on, on these sites that were clearly places where people had lived for hundreds of years. And so that connection interested me and it has, has stayed with me. Uh, the Belizeans, if, if one asked them, they would say that they would explain these areas by saying that the Maya carried fertile soils from, from their farms inland and deposited these soils on, on these islands, which or on the coast. Uh, so people did realize that they were an, uh, somewhat anomalous, but how? Um, well, no one has, has looked at except my team. Uh, so, and why a key? You might think, what, what? why a, a, you know, a barrier reef island or a coastal island? Well, for one thing, that's what's kicked it off. For another thing, um, and this is really important about the keys. You can isolate baseline conditions more easily because uh, the, the uh, parent material is, is a kind of reef stone. And it's far less complicated. If you move to the mainland, it is very, very difficult to find baseline conditions. And that would be natural conditions where you can assume or hope that humans have not uh, in interfered or, or lived there, but also where the geology, uh, and the soil for parent material uh, are, are much more complex as you move away from the coast. So because I was interested in a, in a kind of model to prove a point, 
what we have on the keys are, are much are much more manageable in, in those terms. But more recently, we begin to begun to think about Lam and I and why. Well, it is an urban center. Ultimately, I hope that if we are successful in modeling decompositional trajectories, that it can be applied to a more complex site such as Lam and I. But the other reason, and I'll, I mentioned this, um, but you could you could ask me questions because I can't. I don't know how much I can talk about it, but um, one of the major interests today in the circular economy, but also considering carbon emissions, is our mineral-based construction materials like cements and uh, concretes and lime, uh, which are used in construction. And apparently, they're the major construction material, despite, you know, we might see steel, but the major material used in construction are mineral-based construction materials. And their production involves a, a lot of carbon emissions. So there has been a concern uh, with uh, climate change to, to look into how these carbon emissions uh, can be uh, limited. Uh, and I'm working with a, a group here at UCL, which is called, as you see here, ICEC, that's the Interdisciplinary Center, uh, Interdisciplinary Circular Economy Center for Mineral-Based Construction Materials, headed by a colleague, Julia Stegeman in the engineering department. And it's, it's a multi-university group, but they are all looking at mostly at manufacture, reuse, and recycling. And one of the things that we know from Lam and I is that when, when you allow mineral-based construction materials to decay, so in other words, dumping them in, in landfill is not a bad thing because over time, they contribute not just to soil thickness, but a range of minerals that increase both uh, nutrient capacity and biodiversity. So th this again is why I say in modern policy, this idea that all waste is bad is to me the most topsy-turvy uh, thinking. It's as if uh, even the circular economy, they call waste leakage and they kind of shove it to, oh, well, we shouldn't be wasting. Are you kidding? We waste all the time and we're going to continue to do so. We should face it and we should consider waste as the way to return resources to the environment. So why Maya sites? Well, that's where I've worked. <laughs> that's where I've worked all my life and that's what got me interested in it. Uh, but the Maya sites have long and can, where I've worked, I've been fortunate, they have a long and continuous occupation. Uh, Lamanai goes back to about 1600 BC. On the key so far, the earliest levels are underwater, so it's difficult, but the, the, and we haven't actually cored down to the earliest levels, but so far we go back to about 400 BCE. I have 400 BBC here hmm. um, to modern time. So there's good chronological control. And the other thing about the tropics, and I have written about this in the past, and I think in one, in one of uh, Bill's, Bill's books, historical ecology books, um, that they can, the, in, the, in the tropics, decay is more rapid than in temperate climes, and it can act as a kind of, of laboratory. And also, decay within the lifetime of individuals in, in the neotropics, people are aware of decay processes, and their be behavior is modified uh, to, to account for that. Whereas we in, in the temperate north, I guess you could say, uh, we, we tend to think of buildings as lasting, you know, longer than us or a lifetime. And, and we're not as cognizant, I think, of, of decay as a, as a process. Now, I mentioned Laminar, so I just throw in a couple of pictures uh, so that you can see the massive amount of limestone construction, plasters, lime. Uh, you can see grass here, but of in the past, that was all completely covered with, with plaster. Uh, and this continued at least until about 11, 1200. And then we do get a, a decline in masonry architecture. There's still occupation. but uh, So we have a situation in which I can look at mineral-based construction materials and, how, and make the point about their decomposition and the, the effect on the environment. The area around Lamanai and the sites in this area is where everyone used to come to farm uh, because the soils are so fertile. Uh, the problem 
now is that the whole northern part of Belize has gone over to commercial agricultural farming. So there has been huge deforestation, except for, for Lamanai and Kakabish, two of the sites that are uh, within 10 kilometers of each other. Um, okay, so I mentioned all that about cements and concretes and um, study of mineral-based construction materials at Lamanai. Uh, and so that's what one of the things we hope to do. Most of the work though, I've been doing out on the key <clears throat> and I hope to go to go back there. We, I did try for funding in the years that I knew, knew Bill, I tried for funding in Canada. In fact, I went to the Amazon, I linked up with Darcy Kern and Eduardo Neves and others in the Amazon. I could not get a dime out of the Canadians. I, I don't know, it was very sad. So when I was offered the job here, I thought, well, maybe, you know, maybe the British will have, a broader mindset. You see, the, the thing is, my this project falls in the cracks between <laughs> the sciences and the humanities. In Canada, I could not, the, the goal is really a, sci, a scientific problem, but in, in Canada, if you're not a scientist, you can't apply to uh, NSERC. Here, I can, and I've tried, but the hoops that one has to go through, one has to get through the universities, which looks at all of the science projects in the university, and you know, an archaeologist or social scientist submitting something that that actually has a, a science goal is it, it just doesn't it's not something that is usually selected. So now I am trying more social sciences to see if we can we can make this connection. But Leverhulme Trust and they they specialize in weird interdisciplinary projects gave us funding in 2013 2016. So we were able. Uh, to make some attempt to study the connections between anthropogenic materials or remains and the impact on, on soil formation um, to determine the nature of the deposits and their contribution to the soil sediment profile. It was both successful and I realized what <laughs> how difficult this was going to be. Now we focused on Marco Gonzalez, which is the southern tip of the key, but soil formation has occurred many places. In fact, I would, as far as I know, anywhere on the key practically that I've dug a hole. And here you can see this is a in San Pedro, which is now covered with condominiums, but you can um, see the soil uh, dark earth here that has developed over. Uh, over sand. And most of this dates to the post classic because the entire uh, beachfront has accreted uh, in, in the last few hundred years. It's interesting that in Belize, despite soil, despite sea level rise, the coastline has accreted, uh, which is another interesting phenomenon that I had hoped to study, but it's, it's another complicated matter. Um, so the, the, in this Leverhulme project, we, we tried to cover everything. So we looked at what people did in the past to produce what are now strata. Of course, I already had quite a bit of information on this, but what we introduced was soil micromorphology so that we could try to identify uh, in greater detail the various activities. And this is what Richard McPhail helped us with. He's a soil micromorphologist here. Uh, Dan Evans is my mentor in soil science. He was not part of this original the original project on the key, but has since been very engaged with me and with Christian and Ben and other people. And uh, he is the first, and I've been, as I say, I've been at this since 1975. He is the first soil scientist who considered what, what I was saying as interesting. <laughs> and that, uh, I mean, there are soil scientists who, who, because of the Amazonian research, they'll say, yeah, Soil formation can be associated with human occupation, but but looking at the detritus of human activity as soil parent material has not yet been um, how shall I say subject to good scientific methods, and part of it is because most soil scientists, most a lot of scientists see see nature there. There's natural processes and there's people and never the twain shall meet. And so that where they've looked at anthropogenic soils, they classify, oh, do they love classifying. So they're either from mines or they're from wastelands or they're from particular factories. So in other words, 
they define these soils when they know where they've come from. So they look at them, you know, the modern planet and they will classify mining soils as anthropogenic. But the idea that civilizations of the past have decayed and provided parent materials, there, there's no category for that uh, because it is both natural and cultural and ecological. And it, it's, it's, it's outside many of the uh, disciplinary uh, spheres, I guess you could say. So Dan was the first. He got his PhD at Lancaster a couple of years ago. His speciality is soil formation and pedogenesis. So he, he's been a real, uh, his ideas have been a gift. Uh, one of the other things we did was to look at environmental change over the longer term. And that's where Simon Turner came in. He's from the geography department here. Uh, this is Lindsay Duncan, who I'll explain what she did shortly, but they did quite a bit of coring. And this is an area where we tried, we tried to core in an area where we, there was no evidence of, of human activity. Um, and on the right is Julia Stegeman, who is, I mentioned as the head of the Interdisciplinary um, Circular Economy Center here for mineral-based construction. But she was also the co-PI on this project. And that's a, a long story, but she helped to introduce a couple of models of life cycle assessment um, and material flow analysis, uh, which were part of Lindsay's PhD. And we hoped to look at these environmental impact models that are used today and, and see if we could apply them to the past. And there's complications there. So if you're interested, you can, you can ask. Um, Mark Pollitt was not on the original project, but I've worked with him since, and he's a soil ecologist. And this is, and there are two things that are, that are well, no, soil ecology. To understand the impact humans have had on the environment, you, you can't separate them from ecology because they immediately change not just plants, but but the, the animals, the fauna uh, that uh, occupy the areas where humans have lived. Uh, but in, the most obvious at Marco Gonzalez are land crabs. And, and interestingly, crabs came up in Bill's talk, I think. There were women who were using the land crab holes, which filled up with water, uh, as drinking water. Uh, here, we can't do that because the water is brackish and we're along the coast. But the land crabs are the most amazing ecosystem engineers. Um, they dig to the water level back and forth, back and forth. So they are bioturbators and they not only help to oxygenate the soil, but there are very activities of eating and defecating and mixing things up uh, helps in, uh, uh, as I said, oxygenation, but also in changing the conditions for uh, increasing nutrient capacity. Uh, and they are just one, the only ecosystem engineer I, I know about, but there are insects, uh, there, there are birds that are attracted to the site. So there's so much scope there for eco ecological studies. The other thing that is for some reason neglected and one of my, one of my failed grants <laughs> was uh, looking at the, the long-term effects of the decay of human bodies, cadavers in cemeteries uh, over over the long term. And uh, Mark has done some work on this. And one of the things he's discovered that we hope to investigate is that when humans de decay, um, they change the uh, microbiota in such a way, especially funguses, things like that, in such a way <clears throat> that nutrients are, are retained. But even when the body has decayed, the uh, soil has changed substantively. So it maintains that, that I guess you could call it a, an ecosystem, you know, even when, when the body is no, no longer decaying. And, and uh, this is very important f f in cemeteries because people are buried next to one another, but not close enough, but enough so that they're Oh, it sounds awful, but their cadaver pools <laughs> overlap. Uh, and when we, when I think about cities and how populations in cities can contribute to soil fertility, there is you couldn't get much better than a bunch of dead people. But it isn't a hugely popular subject. It it was well received by the by the uh, 
cemetery management people, but I, I don't know, maybe I didn't appeal to the British Academy enough, but um, I think it's a subject that um, it's gonna need a, a little bit of work, but there's no question how important dead bodies are. Uh, and vegetation, this has been the love of my life and the one thing that I will not probably not see effected in my lifetime, <laughs> but um, the, it is the modern soils that I'm interested in. Uh, where I've been working in Belize, it's the vegetation that, that tells you about the fertility of the soils. Um, and the nature I have learned from working with people who have, have come out with me that uh, the biodiversity reflects well, it reflects the fertility of the soils, but in turn, it reflects all of the subsurface anthropogenic features. Now, at first, I thought when back in the 1970s, oh, if you find a, a chaka, which uh, one of the trees that grows in, on archaeological sites, you know, that tells you what's there. But when I've had botanists out to the site, they've taught me that it's more complicated than that, that it has to do with the nature of diversity. But you can learn so much from the plants because they don't just tell you how fertile the soil is. They tell you the history of the land use in this area. But you have to know, you have to be a botanist. You have to know the plants really well. And um, I found Q absolutely no help at all. But I've worked with the uh, Royal Botanic Garden in Edinburgh, and they are just fantastic. And uh, Richard and Christina were then students. They now have their PhDs. They largely work in pine forests in, uh, in Scotland, but they, we have reported on this. They did the first uh, survey of the site uh, m measuring the, uh, the diversity. And uh, what, what I learned though, is that this is a project in itself. And if I have the time and if I live long enough, I think I will try to devote time just, just to the relationship between diversity and anthropogenic features, subsurface features. Uh, some of you probably know Manuel Arroyo Kalin, he came out to the original pro project and helped us in comparison of uh, what we now call the dark earths in the Maya area with uh, the Amazon. and. Um, Manuel and I are uh, supervising the student who will do the work at, at Lamanai. Uh, okay, I'm gonna probably finish up. Um, one, I, I mentioned that one of the reasons that the Maya area or where I've worked in the Maya area is beneficial is because we know so much about chronology. And this is just to give you an idea at Marco Gonzalez, it's, it's interesting because we have a lot of decomposition and we have some excellently preserved ceramic material. Uh, and that provides a lot of the dating rather than radiocarbon dates because the ceramic material in the Maya area, people forget, but it's based originally on um, Maya calendar dates that are associated with various burials and caches. Uh, so, so we have pretty good chron chronological control within about 100 to 200 years. Uh, and this is just one of the profiles that Marco Gonzalez and these vessels were found. These are one of the very earliest deposits at the site, as you can see uh, at the bottom. Um, a lot of the ceramics are well preserved over time. This is all time of the Maya collapse. Um, the, the merchants were doing great out there. Uh, I, I, my, my hypothesis, in fact, is that the merchants engineered the collapse and very much as the British East India Company engineered a lot of the collapses of the South Asian kingdoms. Uh, so we have good, uh, good dating. Where the ceramics uh, disintegrate for this next project, uh, we'll have a post a postdoctoral student, Carmen Ting, who will be looking at the tempering material because original indications show that the tempering material of a of pottery at a of especially late classic times because they were doing massive salt processing and they were using a particular kind of ceramic to do this. And it had quartz uh, temper that was imported from the mainland and that is extensive in the surface soils today. Although I have been challenged and some people, some uh, my colleagues have said, you have to show that it isn't windblown. Uh, Sahara 
quartz, but I've had master students working on this and, and the quartz is either from the Maya mountains or from the northern coastal plain of Belize and that's what's used in the ceramics and over time it makes its way into the surface soil and uh, greatly uh, helps drainage. And then we do get complete artifacts, of course, but these also break down and you can see on the lower left, the sort of mid, mid range size of these materials when they break down. So we did, we did a series of, well, sieving to get these um, smaller uh, products, but, but we erred because what we should have done, we have to collect everything. And we let a lot of the soil material go through the sieves. And so our collecting technique, which was fine for archeology span uh, was not sufficient to to determine uh, how the breakdown of these materials affects uh, soil composition. Uh, but we did make attempts and here we tried to grinding of um, pottery, uh, some of the chert material, uh, just to see what minerals were there. And there is a problem now, even with, with grinding, grinding the material and detecting um, some of the mineral components. The, as I mentioned, the uh, soil micromorphology, the, micromorphology that Richard carried out was really, really amazing and helping us to uh, further define the, the activities that people were up to. Uh, we had suspected that these uh, vessels were used in salt processing, but Richard uh, identified uh, tidal flat muds, muds that coated the insides of some of these, these sherds. He found uh, microfloors, he found copper lights. So the contribution to the activity, uh, the record of human activities, it, it was amazing. Um, what it doesn't do, and this is what I didn't realize and what we have to do in the next project, it, it is not geared to identifying uh, soil formation components uh, per se. Uh, we did look at how the environment changed over time. That's what uh, Simon did. And he also did uh, took a whole series of samples of the surface soils to have a look at the, the minerals and the components, and as well as cores in some of the lagoons, the lagoon water. And the, the results of the cores did show this. Let's see if I can do this. Here is, which is in uh, the, about the early classic, about four, 400, between 400 and 500, you can see quite a, a difference in uh, what was draining into these uh, lagoonal areas. So it is, this is like a broad picture, uh, and Simon, ha we have published on this, if anyone is interested, of the kinds of changes that took place once people came out to the key, established themselves uh, on this area. Uh, above the waterline and how things change through through time. Yeah, this I I I will can talk about if if you are interested in later. But this has to do with our effort to see if we could use life cycle assessment uh, to to and relate it to human impact. But it's it's difficult because the modeling for life cycle assessment is what Julia and other environmental engineers use. Today, like on mining sites or landfill sites, to determine what the impact will be in the future. We know what the impact is by the nature of the surface soils. What we were interested in is whether we could use that same model to determine what had happened that resulted in the conditions that we see today. Now, it is possible. <laughs> But and Lindsay, who you see here, her she wrote her PhD thesis on this. If anyone's interested, but it was a lot more complicated than we thought, and uh, I haven't even included it in the next grant application because it really needs it really needs an application on its own. But one of the things you have to do is estimate the entire quantity of material uh, that is entering the environment. And we didn't do that. It, that that's a project in, its, in itself. Um, but Lindsay had some really, really interesting results. For example, one of the more polluting uh, activities was lime making. Uh, but over a period of time, 
things changed and the residues actually added nutrient qualities to the soil. The salt processing must have devastated the environment. The work that's been done on the uh, vegetation shows that the fuel was based on the island. They weren't importing fuel from the mainland. So it was different uh, species of mangrove were used as the fuel for salt production. Went on for at least 150 years. Very intensive. They must have, dare I say, deforested uh, the southern part of the island. But again, after 100, 200 years, that addition of carbon to the soil benefited uh, the fertility. So this is this interesting, you know, balance between this destruction and benefits. Um, one of the things that it, it's difficult is recovering pollen. It's not well preserved, but Lindsay did recover macrobotanical material some. Again, this is going to take more work. But one of the interesting things that we hope we think we can look at next time is when cultivable soils first appeared on the island, like in time. Uh, we know that they're cultivable today, but you know, when did are there earlier uh, levels at which um, dark earth, let's call it dark earth, uh, developed, which people could then use for cultivation. There is some indication from our work and also from Bronwyn Whitney's, who's a paleobotanist uh, in Nottingham, that uh, more crops began to be cultivated over time. And today on the key, they can grow tree crops, uh, fruit, cr fruit crops. I don't see maize, but we do see a variety of uh, tree and fruit crops. So that is very, very interesting because one wonders if by post-classic times, could people uh, increase uh, their, uh, you know, ability to live on the key as a result of the accumulation of this soil. And I, I already mentioned the studies of, of the land crabs that Francesca did. They're just amazing creatures. Uh, there's her original BA uh, research when she looked at um, the relationship of them to soil formation. And here is just one example of one small part of the site. And it's not even where there are huge amounts of land crabs, but what they do is they, they dig holes all the way to the uh, water surface because they have they breathe um, oxygen through the water. And, and so the results in this uh, perturbation or bioturbation of, of soil. The, they're good if you're interested in soil. They're bad if you're an archaeologist because they mix levels up really badly. I've seen them carry up jade beads. I've seen them drop things into their, their um, hole. So archaeologically, they're uh, a mixed blessing. So what are we doing now? I'm submitting an a AHRC uh, grant application, I hope. Um, we've, I've been involved with um, Christian and Ben on an AHRC-sponsored network that looks at pre-Columbian tropical urbanism. And that is linked to my, to my soil studies. Um, I've written about it in the grant. I haven't talked about it so much here, but um, in addition to studying uh, soil changes over time, we, we hope to look at how people might have engaged with those, with those changes in the soil. Uh, and so my whole raison d'etre, I guess you could say, is to get people today to think about all of this as this. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Liz. Uh, extremely okay. uh, inspiring and thought provoking, as always. <laughs> um, let's, uh, let's see if we have any questions. So please use the uh, uh, raise hand tool. Uh, Are you going to monitor that sort of or? Yeah, I'll help you. Or, okay, yeah. yeah. Who's okay. first? Nobody. Well, the, the, the uh, to start to kick this off, I have a question. Oh. Emily, Emily <laughs> ha actually, Emily has a question. So let's go for Emily. I saw that Joel were waving as well. Do you want to go first, Joel? You go, you go ahead. I'm yeah. no hurry. 
No, so thank you for a super interesting uh, talk. Uh, but my question is a bit of a sideline, uh, perhaps. Uh, so I was wondering, you talked about carbon storage. And uh, to this day, uh, you know, the botanists are struggling to calculate carbon storage underground. So here, I think also we as archaeologists potentially have some methodological insights to teach uh, those that are calculating our carbon storage of trees and so on. Is that something you have discussed with colleagues? Uh, I think with Richard McPhail, I have. Um, and I haven't incorporated that question into this grant, but we could. It's not a, not a you know what I mean? It's not. <laughs> It's not like the life cycle analysis that's going to require a lot of other input, but yeah, and that's a good question because I have to admit I I haven't thought as much about that about carbon storage, but I Richard has. It be super interesting, and also because you have the long term record, so we can say okay, it stores carbon, but for how long and under what circumstances? Because I think we really acutely need to question the mathematics of the uh, forest plantation calculations um, that are very ahistorical and based on rather poor maths, I would say. Uh, I'll ask Dan about that as well, yeah. Dan and Mark. Um, and I, I think you'd be in a perfect position to go into that. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. Let me just say that I, I, the, I think that's uh, the extremely important, uh, Im important question and a very good comment that relates to what what you said very early on in your your talk. Uh, that is about sustainability, and we need to question, you know, for how, for how long that we consider you know processes being sustainable, which is also one of the key questions that Joe Tainter has for for looking at sustainability from an archeological perspective. And this for how, yes, but for how long is such a crucial, uh, crucial general question that archeologists do have, uh, you could potentially have a different answer to than basically any, anyone else. So, so a very, very good and thoughtful uh, question, I thought. Uh, Joel, did you raise your hand before? Yeah, this this question about how long it takes for soils to replenish themselves, uh, Liz, this this has been a question in my mind for about as long as you worked on it. The, you remember Carl Bootser published a book in the probably in the seventies. It was the archaeology as ecology and stuff like that. And in that, he says something about how it takes. Uh, he was working in the Mediterranean at that time. He said it took a thousand years for the soils around the uh, uh, Mediterranean to replenish themselves after the damage that was done by the Roman Empire. I've always wondered about that number, you know, a thousand years. There's, a, there's an author named uh, Chu who has a book called The Reoccurring Dark Ages, and he uh, he bases the uh, the rise and fall of, uh, of virtually all of the uh, uh, Eurasian civilizations on this on the idea that the soil fertility, exactly as you describe it, is what caused these civilizations to fade into history. And also, he he considers forest uh, health too. But anyway, I was wondering how is how is Bootser's thousand year target on soils replenishing themselves? Uh, like it might be in the tropics that that it's faster than that, according to what you were saying. Well, I haven't looked at the Mediterranean data. One of one of the things that I I've emphasized in the grant is that we are looking more locally. You know, I'm not making sort of broad statements. Well, I am, but um, to study what Butzer was talking about, I think you really have to do what I I want to do, which 
the Leverhulme only partly, we're only partly successful, which is to learn how to track decomposition until you have what we might call soil. Now, what you mentioned replenish. I, I think that on the key, the original soils are maybe five centimeters thick and you know they support completely di different vegetation. Uh, they support um, palms, uh, maybe sedges. Uh, the soils on the archeological, well, I say archeological sites, that's a funny word too, because an archeological site is simply where people have lived, where we can get at. <laughs> but you know, all over the key, these, these dark soils, uh, darker soils exist because they look dark. And uh, so it isn't even, I don't even know if you called it re replenishing in that case, you're looking at a situation in which you had soils that could not support uh, cultivable crops. Now they can yeah, because you know he, now that, on that land really turns. Yeah, that really turns the picture, the whole picture, upside down in the in the case of of the keys. But it would probably apply to those uh, soil richer soils uh, in Belize that uh, uh, that you. Do you, do you subscribe to the idea that they carried soils from the mainland and build up the? <laughs> no, no. Know, I mean, we've at least we've been able to show that in the in the publication. No, you're looking at a, a you know, a, I don't know whether the term Bill used it endemic, but it it's happening right there before your before your eyes. I think part of part of the problem has to do. I love soil science. I love soil, but when you when you read the soil science literature, you can tell they've got stuff in the backs of their heads that they they look at a soil profile and it because I did take some field courses and the way an archaeologist would look at it the way a soil scientist look would look at it is so different and what I'm trying to do is bring the two together because what I thought what Richard McPhail did that soil micromorphology was the answer but it isn't it's the answer to defining as best you can what humans have left behind. You need a soil scientist in there to look at the same material as if it were, you know, one of his field projects where he's not least interested in what humans have done, but just characterizes the chemistry and the mineralogy and the organics. Um, and as far as I know, no one has done that yet. And uh, I'm sorry that I didn't think of it on the first project. But it it is interesting how our discipline, like as I as I we did with the sieving, and then we let the stuff that went through the sieve, you know, the, the soil <laughs> float away. <laughs> you know, we had to save everything. But it was it was hard. Uh, even now, it's hard trying to you know to think across disciplinary boundaries. Uh, and also, there there is there is usually a feeling among People who study uh, soils for agriculture study synchronic uh, soils, you know, across the landscape. And usually there's no, at least when I used to read that material, there's no effort to think that what's on the surface might reflect a history of what is below the surface. But then, and if you look at soil scientists, they study things diachronically, but they're, but not, not, <laughs> I don't know, not as a way to learn about how soils might become more fertile. It's, it's really strange. It's changing now. It's absolutely, there, there are huge changes. People writing about soil security, talking about soil connectivity, about crossing disciplinary boundaries, but I have the answer and I can't get the money, <laughs> right? <laughs> I really do think I have part of the answer and, and I'm old now and I, I could cry because I'm hoping that some of my students will continue this work uh, because it's really important. It will require planners to think longer than a generation or two. They're going to have to think about 100 years. I have, tr I have tried to links with landfill people for years, and it's really difficult. They do not, they think that because you're from a university, you're going to criticize what they do. And no matter how many times I've tried to connect with landfill people, I just... <laughs> They just won't do it. Although I now belong to the Chartered Institutes of Waste Management. I've been to construction meetings. I've been to 
waste or I'm hoping, you know, that before I become so old, I need a wheelchair, I can get some links that I can pass on to my students. Because this is really important today, the circular economy, they're talking about minimizing waste. They're not, they're not thinking that the world around us is waste. Wow, but we know answer. that. We know it. You see what I mean? It's very frustrating. May I may I follow up on that with 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 a question? Because you're working closely with Julia Stegeman, who is the waste waste scientist or whatever. And I also remember that at one of the workshops that we had in 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 Whitstable, uh, as part of the um, True Life. Um, network that you mentioned in one of your slides that you also invited and we had a guest from who was a landfill i don't remember i don't recall his name but he was a landfill expert yeah. so anyway you so so my point is that you have contacts with these with julia of course she's also at ucl but i think that the landfill person was a um uh, was not an academic right yeah uh, he was at uh... he was a, Okay. at Portsmouth, I think. All right, okay. But so my question is really, so, well, you basically really already answered it, but uh, do you find that there is an interest in the general, you know, or are there openings for a potential interest in the insights that you are bringing? Not, among, that, that... not among landfill people, not oh. so far. And I have tried for years. Right. I haven't let up, uh, mm -hmm. but I, I, I don't know, it would be easier to, walk on my hands so I tell you they the I have someone now Carl Williams who's at um, Central Lancaster but they'll be interested in the beginning and then they they, they don't really want to hear about it anymore and I get the feeling that they think there's it might get them in trouble in some way I mm. I don't know I, I, I don't know but to me and even Julia said oh landfill that's you know that's in the past people have already studied landfill it's not popular anymore <laughs> You know, I mean, what what we do is study old landfill archaeologists, you know, so I it, someday I think the world will wake up to it, but it might be too late. I worry that it's too late now because it's it's not even and this is what I've talked about in, in policy meetings where they don't think I'm completely out of it. It's not the onus should not be on the landfill regulators, although it is now they are responsible for all, all the rubbish that comes from everywhere. The responsibility has to be on the manufacturers. You know, law has to change so that when something is manufactured, either this bottle or my scarf or this shirt, that the manufacturers have to anticipate the decay of that material, the decomposition, what's going to happen in landfill, and then list the, what it can be buried with that might encourage uh, decomposition. Now you might say, oh, well, what about pollutants? You know, we're finding that Marco Gonzalez has mercury pollution, mercury contaminants, and it's not modern. It's one of the things we hope to discover. The uh, plant people were able to trace or identify certain plants and uh, trees that concentrated, were bringing the mercury up from pre-Columbian deposits. Now, so that's one of the things we hope to look at. Uh, one of my colleagues, Duncan Cooks, thinks that, oh, maybe they were processing mercury out there because the Maya did use mercury, but it doesn't really make a lot of sense that you would bring cinnabar from somewhere in you know, Guatemala and bring it out to Ambergris Key. So I'm wondering if we're looking at the millions of carnivore fish bones you know, over hundreds of years. So that's one of the things you know, we're going to look at. So people have always contaminated the earth. We shouldn't, but we do. But there are ways to deal with it. There are ways to deal with it, especially given time. I haven't got into plastics because that's another <laughs> that's another thing entirely. Because <laughs> I, as far as I know, plastic does not decompose. It just breaks up into smaller and smaller pieces. So that is is a big danger. But <sighs> you know, right right about now, I I can't um, tackle that. But I would like to get far enough to be able to write policy papers and a book with my colleagues, you know, about landfill and about the, you know, that the emphasis has to be on manufacturing, on, on thinking ahead about how things are going to decompose and, you know, 
this park out here. Well, when I went up to, to Durham, uh, the debris from the coal refineries that had been closed hugely improved the soils there. They were buried. Uh, I talked to one of the, the volunteers, who older men who toured people around. He said that they're getting more diverse plants, more uh, different kinds of birds, that the dust and the coal that entered the water actually seem to protect some of the lobster populations. So that's a perfect example of coal, which is considered, you know, the, the evil of carbon uh, production in the environment. But when you bury the debris, it, 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 makes, it, it makes for greater diversity. Uh, so the, the solutions to our planet, I think, are, are complicated. And I'm not sure so that complexity has worked its way, even, especially into the climate change argument. Yeah, thanks. Uh, the, I noticed before, Federica, that you had your hand up. Uh, and you took it down, but I'm not letting you off the hook <laughs> because I'm thinking, I'm thinking specifically <laughs> since you are also working on you know, inland urban sites in, in, as well as coastal sites in, in, in Africa, Zanzibar, and, Axum and, and Great Zimbabwe. The, what's your what's your comment to uh, to this um, main main thrust here? Uh, well, first, thank you. Very very inspiring and really thought provoking. Um, more than a comment, I think I'll just follow up with a question, uh, perhaps a, a bit of boring one. But I wonder whether you could elaborate a little bit more how you establish your baseline, your day zero on your keys. So, uh, because I, I don't know, but I, you know, you, you're dealing with a hybrid environment. So your terrestrial, freshwater, uh, marshy uh, type of of environment creates, I guess, a, I guess, a complexity of biophysical and, and ecological processes working a different space, a, a different pace across different spaces. So. Uh, and a follow-up on that is whether the way that you establish your baseline, your sort of soil at condition at zero time, can actually provide you a bridge to how soil scientists today, how pedologists assess uh, soil properties and conditions. Well, when we did the, the uh, Leverhulme project, um, that was the first time that I tried to find on the key or, or on the islands uh, an area where we could be reasonably certain that humans had not occupied that spot. And it's, it's really hard <laughs> because you find artifacts everywhere. Uh, we finally went almost off island to some of the smaller little keys that, that border the big key and uh, just looked for a place where there were no sherds, uh, which isn't always a good indication uh, of humans not being there because when I did my PhD research in Stan Creek, the, the entire district almost had no pottery and yet there were cities. So, but anyway, uh, and I had Simon Turner with me who's a geographer and that's where we did the core, some coring, okay. Um, but it's in the next project that the Dan and Mark and the, the soil scientists are involved and they will be involved in a baseline location um, because our only criteria has been, you know, are there sherds, you know, are there mounds um, and how much soil development is there? And also the, the vegetation, you know, because where generally where humans are, there are certain certain plants and trees. But you know how accurate that is. I don't know. So we've only done it for the lever the lever hue, and uh, Simon published some of that. But if I can get this grant and I get the soil scientists out, we can take a much closer look. Now at Lam and I, don't ask. <laughs> you know, I that's one of the reasons I stayed away from the mainland because. <sighs> I, uh, my, I think we're going to look for a paleosol. Uh, let's be interesting, going through several thousand, couple thousand years of buildings. <laughs> but um, 
I'm hoping this, you know, the soil scientists um, can help. There are there are other areas near natural sort of uh, water uh, holes that don't seem to have much evidence of human occupation. But you're right; the baseline location is a problem, and yet it's essential but to I mean, assessing, you know, how humans have changed the environment. If if, if I may say, I would perhaps uh, um, consider whether your inland lemonite site might actually give you better chances to begin to isolate a baseline precisely because you'll be able to isolate geogenic influence on your on your on your soils and sediments and even perhaps if you're not able to establish a point zero baseline but you're able to establish a point where human interference is not as strong mm. then that might become your relations sort of your, your specific yeah. baseline and then you're just looking at intensity and incremental influence rather than starting at zero so because I suppose one problem that we have in historical ecology is that we say if we say that all environments and the sort of places have been somehow uh, shaped by interaction with human societies how then we can expect to have it pockets where human interference hasn't really happened, if that makes sense. No, it does make sense. And I think you're right. Um, but I need, yeah, I need people other than me, I think, like, you know, the soils people to help help me out with this. It's interesting that the ideas are in my head, but I don't, you know, I've not been trained in, in those, those, I understand them, but I, yeah. No, I think that, and I think that's how we will have to go at Lamanai. I've already talked to people who have worked a lot on land use there, like Tim Beach and Cheryl Lozeter Beach and Nick Dunning. And so we're all trying to put our heads together to, to uh, see what can be done at Lamanai. And as I say, I'm hoping that my students can carry, carry on. I wish I could have started 30 years ago. <laughs> I guess then I'll stop. The type of chemistry that Tim Beach does, for example, to characterize these sort of buried soils is the type of chemistry that can will be able to talk, I suppose, to agronomists, a bit like uh, early, the work done uh, some time ago by Christian did. Uh, so in the sense that then you can find a common yeah. ground, because if you're looking at similar sort of elemental mapping, for example, uh, yeah, I've worked with Tim on and off and Cheryl, for, you know, for years. So, uh, in fact, they did the original testing out on Marco Gonzalez. The only, as I said, the one thing that I find with most of the work that's being done on land use, though, is that the interest is, uh, is in on ancient land use, you know, on, on what the Maya, which is, re is really interesting. You know how the Maya handled the soil. How they, Tim's come up with some really, you know, interesting changes in the pre-classic to the classic period, um, concerning how runoff, you know, was was then used. Because I'm interested in today, you know, it's it's I find that um, not as many people are interested in, not the Mayanists are interested. Let's say in how how the soil that we see out there today that's being used you know how did that become what it is if it did you know as a result of what people have been doing for hundreds of years uh, the good thing about lamini and the key is that they have had occupation right up to modern times you know uh and during the maya so-called maya collapse they were thriving so you know we have an interesting sequence but you know and maybe it turns out um I'm wrong. I don't think so, though. I, I do think that human activities are really, really important in the creation of the land surface that, that we have today. If I may, just another one of those follow up questions. The, I was thinking about Lamanai and that you did mention that the, uh, the, the major threat of, of of the, well, the archaeological remains as well as of the soils in the area is the industrial agriculture of the Mennonite community. Yeah, you know. Uh, so, um, have you? Um, have, but you're not. Wor have you worked with any any any? Have you done any research trying to evaluate or assess the impact of the of that agriculture on those soils? Uh, I haven't. But uh, one of my former graduate students, Alec McClellan, 
Mm. Uh, he's 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 worked. He produced a PhD recently just on settlement over time. Yeah, that not just Lamanai though, re, almost sub regionally with Kakabish and that you know sort of that whole area. And he has is has partly worked on the effects of the Mennonites. And I did have an earlier student when I was in Canada, but he didn't he didn't uh, pan out. But no, I don't. You know, and I I won't Christian because I'm old. It's not going to uh, happen. Well, the <laughs> I'd uh, like it to happen, but <laughs> <laughs> so if we can get, if no. you, any of you know anyone would be interested, this would be really important because the Mennonites are well, it's all gone already. Yeah, all, yeah. all, all they chain clear, uh, they chain clear, and the government has had no regulations on leaving land fragment, leaving forest fragments. That 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 alone would have solved the problem. So there is. It is devastating uh, if you're interested in, you know, tropical forest. Now they put cattle and sorghum and stuff like that. And they are fantastic at at all kinds of uh, machinery things. They they make our um, our indestructible pottery storage containers <laughs> amazing. They do amazing stuff, but they, yeah. should, they sure do, you know, deforest. Joel? I thought the to uh, depart the soil for a moment. I thought the most intriguing thing you said was that maybe the merchants uh, engineered the downfall of the interior uh, kingdoms. Where uh, uh, that's my hypothesis. Uh, have you pub Have you published anything on that, or is uh, uh, what's the support for that? Well, I put it all together for a conference that Charlotte uh, Arnaud organized in Isamal a couple of years ago and then in Japan. So I have this put together, but I've dropped hints about it in my papers on uh, weaponry, uh, uh, how weaponry has changed over time, particularly at the time of the collapse, when you begin to see changes in uh, hafting techniques. Uh, I've talked about it and the rules of engagement of, of war. So I've dropped these little hints, in my, but I haven't put it all together. But uh, I did for for Charlotte and it should have been in, in her publication, but I got involved in another publication and um, I'm a very I'm a slow writer, so I couldn't handle it. But uh, I am working on it. I'm, I'm doing a paper in Belize and I am going to publish on it. I've been reading a lot about the British East India Company and uh, it's interesting. People, I think, don't think that in pre-Columbian times, you know, the people who handle uh, commerce, you know, could be that powerful. But I think that one of the reasons the, the, you know, the Aztecs may have said that the Pochteca can't exhibit, you know, upper class clothing and all that stuff is that there's a very strong memory of the Maya collapse being related to to commerce, to the merchants and commerce, because certainly Lam and I, out on the key, <laughs> Maya collapse, they just spring into action, trading like they did in the yeah. early classic, you know. So I know this has nothing to do well, with you know, it, it, soil. It but... <laughs> looks like there's uh, some some evidence that uh, when the cons uh, abandoned Kalak Mool, they headed for the coast. And uh, so I've been thinking, well, maybe they they just saw the handwriting on the wall, you know, it was going to be maritime transportation or nothing. But they uh, they might have been uh, joint saying, well, if you can't beat them, join them. And yeah, I, I wouldn't wouldn't be surprised um, at Lamanai. That is when occupation uh, density increases. Terminal classic and the beginning post-classic. I didn't discover this at my student did. And as I say on the key, you find that if you if you studied everything about the Maya from the coast, you would say that the late classic is the dullest period. Because you don't see the kind of trade that you see for the for the pre-classic and early classic and post-classic. It's kind of interesting. But uh yeah it'll take some time but it I kind of and the early archaeologists said that. You know, said the merchants had something to do with it, and we all, everyone said, "No, oh, no, it's too simplistic." But I, I do think so. Mm. I don't. I, I think there was one of those really remarkable times in 
in history because the material culture, I don't know if those of you know about, you know about the French Revolution and uh, what's his name, Oliver Cromwell. Uh, for a while there, the material culture uh, changed, but it returned to what it had been before those revolutions. In the Maya area, the material culture of the dynasties died and it did not come back. And that to me is, is really significant. Because I'm still looking for other places in history where that's happened and I can't find it. Because usually the new people who come in appropriate the, uh, you know, the signs of, of power and stuff. Anyway, that's an aside. Uh, yeah. There's it's, uh, in uh, Graber and Wentgrove's book, they talk quite a bit about how the, uh, there were great, great kings and and they all got killed by uh, by the city councils i have david's book he his his office is right across the hall but i haven't read it yet and it's not an easy book to carry around for those of you who have seen it but but i will look at it eventually because uh, he's really really interesting stuff except for human sacrifice which is rubbish but that's another talk <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have any more questions or, or comments? Peter, I heard you're laughing there in the background. Yeah, uh, Joel touched on the question I wanted to do that thing, the commerce and the, and the role of these. That's something for me, the early post-classic that's very really interesting, okay? And so, but Joel touched that, so that was my question. But at the same time, um, I don't know. It, it reminds me, I read some a book a some time ago. I can't remember now. It's been too much for the brain to handle. That when there were, I think it was maybe it was uh, 17th century, there was all of a sudden you had this massive collaboration that you didn't have before. And the Dutch participation, all this, and bringing these stressed environments together and how they traded more during times of major stress. And it was a way of surviving, getting over these humps of bad times. And, and that's what this reminds me of a bit, what you were mentioning about the early post-classic, because of the, of the shock of the lowlands, you know, the southern lowlands, and then all of a sudden, the Chichen, all the coastal comes across. And that's, I think that same thing is happening in West Mexico. Tula, the same thing is happening in Tula. Tula gets knocked out because of that. So, yeah, so it's interesting to see how what the Maya region can tell us about that. And that thing that you touched on that question that Joel brought out there, that slide of 8850 and the commerce, that's touching on something that we really have to get in more into, I think. Yeah, yeah we see the change is greater on, earlier on, on the key. This change at I by, I would say by 1150, 1100, mm -hmm. the, the ceramics there look like they're from Veracruz. They're right. not, they're local, but the whole designs, right. but, but the history of, the coast is is uh, circumpeninsular, right, uh, right? And and including going farther south, which I rarely have considered before. You know, we have these. The term Maya is a problem <laughs> in, the, in that regard. You know, because I think that uh, coastal people were very cosmopolitan. West Mexico, we have what you know, clear West Mexican connections at Lam and I from quite early. Yeah. So uh, yeah. it's but it's hard to get. It's hard to get a good dynamic going, I think, when we don't know, you know, how individual groups call themselves and, you know, using the term Maya is really, really problematic. Right. Yeah. And also working from the coast, when you see so much trade, as I say, it's the late classic. That's when they did the, the salt and the, the rest of the trade just drops right off. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's got me to look at Teotihuacan, you know, in the earlier mm -hmm. history as being kind of interrupted. <laughs> by, by something, but I don't know. But yeah, we should yeah. have a conference about that. Yeah, 1000 is a key year for this. I think it's a key across, all the way across, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Very interesting. yeah we got a new burial position too. I don't know, I stuck one of them in there. Did you notice they're all face down with the legs bent back? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We haven't solved that problem though. Okay. So I'll be buried, I think. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Yes. Uh, thank you so much, Liz, for, uh, as I said, and I uh, still um, strongly would 
emphasize the highly thought provoking and inspiring talk. Oh, thank uh, you. And, and uh, the, I hope we can continue to work together in one way or the other. Yeah, uh, or if any of you get your students interested in, you know, an aspect of this. Do our best to make our students interested in this. <laughs> in, in yeah. rubbish, as they say in England, or garbage, as they say in North America. <laughs> Uh, yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Liz. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Liz. Thank you. Bye.